Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are looking at Dunk and Egg. What's the future for them? What are we expecting? What has George R. R. Martin told us about the future for Dunk and Egg? Um, so as always, I'll be framing this around questions that I get from my patrons. And I'm going to try and pick up as many different questions as I can in the chat as we're going through. Um, I tried to do a quick overview of a few things going on in the wider world at the beginning of these live streams. Uh, Westworld is carrying on. I should be very brief on this one. Episode two, I liked it again. I think it's it's on an uptick, Westworld. It's, uh, it's good. Um, and in terms of the rings of power, we've been getting... A last yesterday, I think we got um, a couple of teaser teaser trailers. I think that technically teasers for the teaser trailer for the full trailer for the show, which is on the 2nd of September. Um, it's probably fair to say that Amazon and HBO have got different approaches to this in terms of Rings of Power and uh, House of the Dragon. House of the Dragon, we have been getting some things, uh, but it's been drip fed. Rings of Power, expect from now on almost every day a new thing, a new image, a new mini trailer, uh, a new interview, something. So that's what I think we can expect for pretty much the next two months. If you're interested in that, the best way to keep up with it um, is on Twitter. I will be retweeting all of the new stuff that I see on there. Um, the most recent teaser teaser trailer did have one exciting thing in particular, which you may be interested to note. We got a very brief but very clear sighting of Ents. So we may well be getting some Ents. They should be there. They should be there. Um, uh, but this is the first time we've had any kind of confirmation that Ents are going to happen. So that's what's going on uh, in the wider world. Let's get into Dunk and Egg. Now, um, the, the background to Duncan Egg is it's quite a long one. This is clearly something that George R. R. Martin, he loves. He said this many times. This is a, a couple of characters really close to his heart and stories which are really close to his heart as well. And whenever he's talking, we'll get onto it in a bit, uh, but whenever he's talked about the um, a potential adaptation of this for, for TV, he he goes to great lengths to say i'm i need this to be right the other things yes he obviously cares about canon and things like that but duncan egg clearly very close to his heart we have only three duncan egg stories they're novella length so they're not proper full novel lengths um the first was published back in 1998 the hedge knight this was in an anthology um, called Heroes, or not Heroes, Legends, which, as a complete digression, is a fantastic anthology. It was uh, He was one of the editors, Gardner as well, was the other legendary editor of sci-fi and fantasy, and it was a collection of uh, novella-length stories from some of the finest writers of fantasy and science fiction out there in their main universe, but set slightly away from the main story. So you'll get... Uh, I think Stephen King was in there. I think you've got... Like, I'm not going to go through it. There, there were some real big hitters in that. So it was well worth it. Anyway, The Hedge Knight was there. This was the first one. The second, The Swan Sword, appeared in Legends 2. Again, another anthology. Um, five years later, 2003. And then we had The Mystery Knight, the third one, which was in another anthology called Warriors, which was in 2010. That's the last one that we've had. Since then, these have been turned into graphic novels. They've been collected together in uh, all three of them under A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, so you can buy them as a, as a single volume. And then it's gone quiet in terms of finished products. We do have some information from him, though. The first, we know that he was starting to write... Uh, his fourth one, which was called or had the working title of The She Wolves of Winterfell. And this was going to be um, a follow up ish because they, they followed through the story of Duncan Egg. Um, 
at the end of the Mystery Knights, they're talking, Dunk is talking about heading up to Winterfell and helping the Starks fight the Greyjoys. So it makes sense. The next story is, is up there. And this was going to be in another anthology called Dangerous Women. Now, what happened there was George R. R. Martin started writing this and then got inspiration for something else. He got inspiration for The Princess and the Queen, which is what turned in later to a key part of Fire and Blood, the build-up to the Dance of the Dragons, the Greens and the Blacks, basically. This is that story. So he got sidetracked away from Duncan Egg to be writing about, effectively, what eventually became Fire and Blood. And he admitted that he had another story that he got roughed out in his mind, which he had a working title of The Village Hero. That we don't know huge amounts about uh, in terms of detail. It was going to be set in the Riverlands. Then he has, he's talked about this at various different points. Um, and he said that he wants to tell the whole story of Duncan Egg. And he's got some titles of future stories being um, The Cell Sword the champion, the king's guard, and the lord commander. So that is, if we've got those five we've already talked about and another four, that's nine already in his mind. He has given various different um, numbers when asked about how many there might be. He's, he has, however, said it will be as many as it needs to be in order to tell the story I want to tell. And clearly the first three have not progressed the story hugely in terms of the age of the characters. They're still, the dynamic is still there. And we've got, our, you know, Egg has got to become king and uh, Dunk has got to become a member of the King's Guard. There's a lot that needs to happen. Um, and the clear implication is that both four and five, She Wills of Winter, Winterfell and the village hero are also in that early dynamic. So that's where we're at. We've got a couple of um, updates that I thought it'd be useful just to give you in George R. R. Martin's words what he's said about this. 2014, he did a very long blog post on his Not A Blog uh, when he was talking about Duncan Egg, because at this stage, if you if you remember where we're at, at 2014, he has here, he's um, he's written the first three, started writing the, the fourth, and then abandoned it and instead published The Princess and the Queen. So he felt he wanted to do an update on what's going on with them. Um, so he's uh, that. He says, it has always been uh, my intent to write a whole series of novellas about Duncan Egg, chronicling their entire lives. At various times in various interviews, I may have mentioned seven novellas or 10 or 12, but none of that is set in stone. There will be as many novellas as it takes to tell their tales start to finish. Um, then he talks a bit about the unfinished one, that She Wolves of Winter. He says, the unfinished novella was indeed set in Winterfell and involved a group of formidable Stark wives, widows, mothers and grandmothers that I dubbed the She Wolves. Um, but The she Wolves of Winterfell was never meant to be more than a working title. The final title, when I finish the story, will be something different. There's also another Duncan Egg novella that I've got roughed out in my head with the working title of The Village Hero. That one takes place in the Riverlands. There's no telling when I will have time to finish either of those or which one I will write first. I don't expect I will know more until I've delivered The Winds of Winter. Um, my original intent was to publish all of the Duncan Egg stories in a series of anthologies and then collect them together into one big book. But by the time of the Mystery Night, it became plain that the stories were just too long and that there were going to be too many of them. So instead of one big book, the plan now, and I should say he's not said any different, so this is what we think his plan still is, uh, the plan now is for a series of Duncan Egg collections, each comprised of three novellas. Uh, the first uh, one to consist of the three published stories, which became A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. So um, that's that's where he was at. The other update we've got from this was from March of this year, when 
we know that there is a TV show. I talked about the TV shows a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail about that now. But a TV show is in development for Duncan Egg. The, the format there that they're looking at is one season per novella. You, I'm sure we'll have views on whether that's the best format for it, but that's what they're going with. George R. R. Martin so far seems quite positive about this, and um, it's still in early days. It's in draft uh, state at the moment, hasn't been greenlit, it may not happen, but I think the assumption is that this is probably one of the favourites to be developed. And in the light of Hello. I think my camera just went off. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, let me just see whether I can get my... Um... Oh, I can't get my virtual background back up. Uh, well, apologies. I hope that you can uh, still uh, see me. Um... Is that there? Okay, I'm going to assume that this is still working and you can still see me, uh, but all you've got is the green background. Um, but So I will, I will carry on. Um, uh, apologies for that. I'm uh, clearly having some technical details, at least to the, uh, uh, the, the audio is still working. So um, I think he was, he was bitten a bit by, uh, by this, uh, what happened with Game of Thrones season eight. And I think that he has decided very clearly that uh, he wants to keep ahead of the game when it comes to Duncan Egg. So that's where I think he's at. So I imagine he will want to have already got a, a novella written before they get to there, which actually still gives him quite a lot of time, it has to be said, because with the best will in the world, the we're not going to get a Duncan Egg TV show for at least two years. And then they will have three um, seasons already. So that's already gives him five years. So he's got plenty of time. But I do think that perhaps um, we might see Duncan Egg again relatively soon. If he is wanting to produce something, which I think he will at some point soon, uh, he does like to publish uh, stuff He's a writer, obviously. Um, if this is the quickest and easiest thing to do, it's a novella. He's got it half written already. We know this with the the she wolves of Winterfell. He's got it half written, so he can just quickly dust it off and finish it. So I think that there is hope. Um, is what I'm saying. Now um, I think where let's go to um, questions from. Um, uh, well, I've got some from my patrons. I think I had a few super... Amara Lee, thank you very much for the super sticker. Uh, I hugely appreciate that. Um, also, I had a couple of super chats. I think Amara Lee, you sent a show of love and support um, before we went uh, on air. Thank you very much. And also Brooklyn Traveller saying, um, uh, just wishing me a happy birthday week. Yes, it is my birthday week this week, indeed. Uh, so thank you very much, indeed, both of you. Um, 
Let's start with a question from uh, Shasha saying, Hi, Robert. Today I can just think of a kind of a fun question. Dunk keeps threatening Ed Egg with clouts in the air. So far, I can only remember him receiving one or two. How many clouts will Egg actually receive? Will there be significance in the occasions? Might he receive one for all of his assembled follies at Summer Hall? Um, so this is a fun one. There, there's a lot. Duncan Egg is written in a different style to A Song of Ice and Fire because this comes from Dunk's POV. This is his perspective on life. And that gives us a lot of repetition because that's how Dunk thinks. He thinks things through with sayings and phrases and things that he's learned, particularly from Arlen Pennytree. Again, we get the repetition of things, uh, Dunk the Lunk, thick as a castle wall, that kind of thing. These kind of things keep on coming back. There's a lot of echoing in these stories beca because that is how Dunk is. And one of the things that he says to Egg a lot is, I ought to give you a clout around the ear or, or um, uh, I'm going to clout you in the ear if you do that again. He threatens this a lot. Um, a very quick search through uh, tells me that this happens at least 20 times in the stories that we've got. So he says this a lot. There's only one that I can find. There's only one occasion when he actually does clout him in the air. Um, I've got the, the quote here. This is from uh, the Swan Sword. Um, uh, and then that they have a character that they're trying to see Rohan Weber basically and saying the beard was squinting suspiciously at Dunk. No one sees her ladyship unless the long inch gives his leave. You come with me. Your stable boy can stay with the horses. I'm a squire, not a stable boy, Egg insisted. Are you blind or are you stupid? The beardless guard broke into laughter. The beard put the point of his spear to the boy's throat. Say that again. Dunk gave Egg a clout in the ear. No, shut your mouth and tend the horses, he dismounted. I'll see Sir Lucas now. And a bit later, Egg brings this up and says, you clouted me in the ear at the gate. And then Dunk replies, that was only half a clout at best. If I ever give you a whole clout, you'll know it. Now, this is, um, the reason I read all of that out is to show that Dunk doesn't clout egg around uh, the ear. That's just a thing he doesn't do. And so the main point of this is to reveal Dunk's character. The, the main point of this, I think, is not a sort of a setup for there's going to make, be a moment when uh, Dunk clouts him around the ear and that's a really important thing all of this is being built up to. That may happen. I'll come on to that in just one moment. The, but the main thing here is this is a character reveal for what Dunk is like. He has all these sayings and thoughts in his head, but he doesn't actually want to do the thing. He is there to protect the, the innocent and the weak, and Egg is just a child. Uh, so he he at that instance there that we read, the only reason, as far as we can tell, he actually did it was to potentially save Egg's life. Egg was... Egg, Egg's a prince, he's a Targaryen, and he's going around pretending to be just this squire, and he's coming out and hurling abuse at these random guards and like saying, are you blind or stupid? And Dunk was protecting him. So this is a revelation about Dunk's character, not so much a sort of a build-up to something. But I do wonder whether it will build up to a thing. I don't think... Summer Hall. I don't think everything will be building up to Summer Hall. The, the situation with Duncan Egg is an interesting one, and I, I don't know whether George R. Martin is going to sort of split the books halfway in this, but there is, is a story where the dynamic shifts hugely. We've only seen the first part of this. Egg is a squire to Dunk. Dunk's the person who's in charge. Um, Yes, Egg has got all the power and privilege if he wants it, but he tries trying not to use it. He's he's there being squire to Dunk. And so Dunk is the person who can clout him around the air, and he's perfectly allowed to. That's absolutely fine in their moral code at the time. And Egg, um, he didn't 
object on principle to the idea that he was going to be clouted around the air. He was just trying to point out that he had actually done it then. But that's all going to shift because at some point, Egg becomes Aegon the Unlikely, the, the person no one expected to become king. He becomes king and then the balance of power shifts. Dunk is now suddenly, they're still friends, they still hang out, but Dunk is no longer the person who has the authority to clout him around the ear. Egg is the person who has the authority to clout him around the ear, and more if he wanted to. So I wonder whether that is building up to the point where maybe there'll be a joke about it. I don't know. I don't think this is going to be a big thing, but it just to show where the changed dynamic is between uh, the two of them. And John Morley, thank you very much, saying, Hi, Robert, no question on Dunk, just a big thanks. And a book suggestion. I love book suggestions. The Warded Man by Peter Brett. Really fun fantasy series. Cheers. Well, thank you very much. I shall um, add that to my uh, reading pile. Um, Phoenix Milburn saying, Let's be honest, Dunk versus the Mountain would be a dope fight. Yeah, well, so this is Sir Duncan the Tall. He is seven feet tall we're told the mountain is eight feet tall so um a whole head higher um so dunk is massively tall but not the tallest character in this universe but yes it would be a, a good um fight incidentally i don't think i've got any questions on this but it's uh, just as a complete digression a, a talking about dunk fighting one of the things that i love about george R. R. martin is he, he thinks about these kinds of writing styles he thinks about character hugely and wants that to be reflected in what we see on the page not just in sort of the words and what they're saying but just how they act when you see a description of how dunk fights it's very physical he's charging into opponents he's um uh, swinging uh, his sword thing this is very very similar to how brienne fights the descriptions are the same this is uh, this is something that george r. r martin i'm sure is doing a very 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 subtle nod to the the fact that they are related and their fighting styles are the same there's even when uh, i forget which brienne fight it is but when um dunk is doing the fight here in the sworn sword that we get uh, a little bit later um that is almost echoed by one of Brienne's fights as well. It's a, a fascinating and brilliant uh, writing tool to just let us think through these things. Um, Sanguini saying, just wanted to say thank you for everything you do. I don't get to catch you live too often, but I'll be listening to you on Catch Up tomorrow at work. Well, welcome to however long you can be here. Uh, that's, uh, that's very kind of you. Let's go to... Um, a question actually this is a, a sort of a series of questions i've not done one of these for a while reuven uh, devender saying hello robert how about a quick fire round um for what are the chances of these things happening in percent i'd, I'd love people in chat feel free to pick up on any of these um and he's gone that we meet tansel tansel too tall again um tansel too tall is the love interest i would say in book one um she's the person that Dunk goes in and saves, and then he seems to be sort of hunting for her in later books. I think we'll meet her again. I put it up quite high, 80-90%. Um, Dunk meeting and possibly killing Bennis in a future novella. Bennis appears in the second one, in The Sworn Sword. He is from Dunk's history. He was uh, a hedge knight along with Sir Arlen Pennytree, and then he comes back, he's there, uh, and they have to work alongside him in the Sworn Sword. And um, he's not a nice character. At the end of it all, he basically steals a whole load of stuff and then runs away. Are we going to see him again? I think there's a good chance we might see him again. I mean, 60 or 70 percent. Um, in some shape or form, Dunk will be involved in the disappearance of Rohan. This is Rohan Weber, who is the love interest in the Sworn Sword. And she. Um, eventually she has lots of marriages in her life she ends up marrying into the lannisters and then disappearing and and georgia martin just drops that into the history that she just sort of disappeared um it's, it's the child i think 
it must be something to do with Dunkel, otherwise he wouldn't have made it so you know mysterious like that unless he was going to come back to it. So yeah, I think that's probably pretty high, 70-80%. Uh, Dunk impregnating one of Egg's sisters. Um, I don't think this is very likely. He, had, he has two sisters, uh, Dale and Ray. Uh, we don't know huge amounts about them. Ray, at some point, um, apparently tried to give um, Egg a love potion. Um, and we know that they both ended up being married and having children. But beyond that, we don't know. Um, so I don't I put that down at only like 10 or 20. I think that Dunk's too much honour to be doing anything um, that he shouldn't with, uh, with Egg's uh, family. Dunk befriends Damon the Third, who he will eventually kill in the Fourth Rebellion. He does kill him in the Fourth Rebellion. Uh, you're right, but uh, Damon the Third was born in exile uh, over in Essos, so I don't think there's a chance that um, Dunk will befriend him. Glendon Ball or Glendon Flowers will become a Kingsguard. Um, uh, he's a character in the Mystery Knight um, who. Uh, they befriend and he seems to very a very competent fighter he is a hedge knight um got there by uh, a bizarre backstory um and seems to genuinely be one of the good guys um will he become a king's guard i mean he's a hedge knight he's um uh, he's a bastard it's not likely i don't think but hey uh if anyone's going to do it egg will um, Dunk becomes Kingsguard under Makar. That's Makar is Egg's father. I think it'll probably be under Egg rather than Makar. Uh, Dunk at the Battle of the Long Lake between the Wildlings and the Starks. I can't see him going up for that. Um, Dunk winning a jousting tournament. I think this is pretty high. Um, obviously, we start all of this with uh, Dunk at a jousting tournament, the Tony of Ashford uh, Meadow um, in the Hedge Knight. Um, one of the names of the books that George R. R. Martin has is The Champion. That's the uh, a novella. It's the so we've got the Sellsword, the Champion, the King's Guard, and the Lord Commander. Um, the Champion hints that maybe he's going to win a win a tourney. Um, he certainly we know that he carries on doing tourneys because he fights a very young Bar Sir Barristan uh, later one. So I think it's a good chance he will one, win one. Raymond Fossaway will appear. He appears in the first um, uh, The Hedge Knight, um, and he fights on Dunk's side. Um, will, he, will we see him again, the Green Fossaway? Possibly the Green Apple. Uh, possibly. 50-50. Um, I don't think he's a huge character, but, um, yeah, we may well see him again. Um, uh, Uber Mellon saying, I'm sorry, I know this isn't about Duncan Egg, but I've been waiting all week to ask, could the three black candles that the maesters use be broken or tampered with? Why would the maesters risk them working? Um, okay, yeah, there's a bit of a digression, but, um, I'm happy to quickly answer this one. So the, the maesters have... Um, some uh, black candle, obsidian candles, um, which are magical in as much as they allow you to communicate and see over great distances. We actually see one of them working in Sam's last chapter. Uh, Marwin the Mage has got one, and he seems to have used it to... Um, to... Uh, be tracking Sam's progress, which is how they knew the, in the boat coming down, which is how they knew when he was about to arrive. So that they that's what they're there for. The, they have not used, um, they, they have not been working for a long time. None of them have. We've, we were told that they just started working again after Danny's dragons were hatched. So that seems to have been the thing which sort of pushed the ambient level of magic in uh, Planetos up to a level where they could start uh, using them again. Um, so for all that time, were they broken? Well, they just weren't working because none of them were working. Might they have tampered with them? It's possible. The, the fact is that the maesters were convinced that magic did not exist. This is part of the, um, or had gone away. 
this was part of the initiation right for somebody to become a maester was you spent a night in a room with these four candles and um attempt to get them to light attempt to get them to work and you couldn't and that was supposed to teach you that magic does not work so this is a, a, a central part of becoming a maester is going through this thing to teach you that magic does not work. So might they have done some dirty tricks to make doubly, triply sure that magic does not, those candles do not work? Um, uh, possibly. Uh, the glass candles did start working again later. Did they change their right initiation rights? We have not been told. So... It's possible. I certainly wouldn't put it past them, but for the period of time that we're talking about, they weren't working anyway. Um, Andrew Kay talking. I talked about what I was talking about with the Dunk and Brienne fights. Uh, quite a few similarities. There was a reverse echo with a dagger and a rock being used. Dunk used a rock against a dagger. Brienne used the opposite. Yeah. So th there's a lot of this kind of echoing uh, between the two of them. Let's go for, um... oh, Chris Ballerina just asking who wins one-on-one, -on -one, Dunk or Gregor Clegane? I mean, I think, I think it's Gregor Clegane. Um, I think so. I mean, he's, he is, the way he's described is all, almost inhuman. Um, and the, what George R. R. Martin often likes doing is creating these, battles between somebody who's big and strong but slow moving with somebody who's lithe and uh, fast and more lightly armored um, and the person who's more lightly armored often wins it happens with Bronn in uh, the Eyrie the, we also we then get the classic matchup is the mountain against the red viper um, Oberyn and that Oberyn did win. Oberyn Martell did win until the very end. So that was a kind of a slightly twisting on his side. Um, but Dunk and the Mountain are both the same. So it's just that they use roughly the same kind of tactics. Um, so you would expect the bigger, tougher person to win probably the Mountain. So, I mean, it's, it's not the nice answer that we want. Um, but uh, that's probably where we're at. Um, let's do a question from 444, um, saying, as the waiting for the next Duncan Egg story is even longer than for the Winds of Winter, it is, um, I hope George R. R. Martin will publish one or two this year. I hope Harry Lloyd will record audiobook for the new stories. I wonder who are the She-Wolves of Winterfell and if Dunk met, meets his father at the Night's Watch. Okay, so a few different things there. Um, Will he publish some this year? I don't think so. Um, I would hope maybe next year. I think he's, I mean, he is still writing uh, The Winds of Winter, and I think that he probably will do that and then write uh, one or two of the uh, Duncan Egg stories, maybe even three. If, if he's still sticking to this idea of doing them sort of three at a time, then maybe he'll do three and then move on. But uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I think this year is, given that he's not said that he's prioritising, he's just sort of said, oh, yeah, I really should write some more of them. I, I'm not expecting it. Um, in terms of Harry Lloyd um, recording the audiobook, yeah, this is something I've said this almost, I think, every time we've been talking about Duncan Egg, because Harry Lloyd is the, you'll know him as the actor who played Viserys in season one of Game of Thrones. Um, he's the voice actor who audio narrates the Duncan Egg stories, and I genuinely cannot think of any other marriage of voice actor and uh, story that works better than that. He just absolutely nails it. He he nails Dunk's tone and voice as well as the other characters and the feel of the thing as a whole. He's got a there's a hint of whimsy to it without it ever losing that kind of gritty George R. R. Martin feel as well. Uh, so yeah, I would highly recommend the audiobooks, um, uh, not just because it's good fun having audiobooks, but because this is a particularly good audio narration. In terms of the Shebels of Winterfell, 
I've, uh, I mean, I, I said what George R. R. Martin has said before, um, but five Lady Starks running Winterfell, with four of them being widows of a bunch of fairly recent former Lord Starks and the current Lady Stark, whose 30 something husband is fading fast from a wound taken from fighting the Ironborn. That's a kind of a summary. But basically, we're not given all of the detail of this, but from the hints that we've had from various places, around this time, the the Starks had problems not just with the wildlings, but also with the Ironborn. They were doing lots of raiding um, along the West Coast, and as a result, the Starks were at war quite a lot. And the Stark lords died. A lot of them died in quite quick succession, which left a situation where what it sounds like is we actually have four different widows of former lords, plus the current wife of the lord, um, all around at the same time. And it does seem like we might be going into something akin to a stark succession crisis, certainly a who's actually in control crisis. Because if, if you've got a situation where the Lord is heading off to go and fight lots of battles, then who's left in charge? All of these people who all have at their various times been managing Winterfell. So that is the dynamic that we've got going on there. You can add into that dynamic, I, I suspect, because this is what Dunk was wanting to do. He was wanting to go and join one of those expeditions off to fight the Ironborn. You can add into that dynamic, I suspect, um, the uh, Dunk meeting old man as young man. That's just a sort of a hunch. We, we have a, an image possibly of that, which I can talk about if you're interested later. But it does make me wonder whether, because... When in the mystery night, Dunk mentions this to someone I can't remember who he and he says, "I'm going to go and do that." And the response comes, "Well, you don't have to go all the way up to Winterfell. You could just sort of head off west if you want to be going fighting the Ironborn." And Dunk says, "No, no, no, I'm going up there." Um, I do wonder whether they actually miss out on this expedition to go to the Greyjoys because it's taken them so long to get all the way up. So they arrive in Winterfell after the army has already left. Um, and then they're faced with this situation of uh, a sort of a, a struggle for control of Winterfell while the Lord is out. The, the issue with the wall, which you also raised there in the Night's Watch, Dunk doesn't know his parentage, basically. Um, he was born, we think, and brought up in Flea Bottom. Certainly that's where he remembers being brought up in and he often wonders who his father might have been where his father might have gone um and he does think because although he does his own intellect down quite a lot he, he he's not stupid um he does think you know what probably my father was quite tall so i probably should be able to kind of um spot him in a crowd and he does wonder whether he might have gone up to the wall that's a a logical place for him perhaps to have, have gone. So that is one of the reasons they're heading north. I don't think, might be wrong on this one, but from what we've seen, I don't think it's likely we're going to see them at the wall. I don't think we're going to have an adventure of them at the wall. We've got one in the Riverlands, we've got one in Winterfell, um, presumably one more in the next trilogy, if that's what it is. Uh, but does he want it to have it up at the wall? I'm not sure. I suspect they will probably come back down south again. Uh, Thomas the Kirschmacher, you're asking about the same thing. Uh, so, I mean, we could, we could. The, the the reason why I'm saying maybe we won't is is simply, I mean, how many stories is he going to write when Dunk's a child? If he wants to do the whole thing, um, the whole tell the whole story, then there are, I mean, even without thinking in any great depth, you've got, you have to do one about Summerhall, you have to do one about him becoming king uh, and exiling Bloodraven, uh, you've got to do one about the um, the Baratheon Rebellion, um, 
that the, there's there's at least three you've got there. You've got to do one showing Egg and his growing fascination with dragons in some way. There's a lot of stuff there that you've got to get through as an adult life. There will be one, presumably, where we see Egg meet up with uh, his uh, wife. So um, how many are you going to do just while we're, we've got um, Egg as a child? I think if we've already got five uh, penciled in for that, then I think that's probably enough. Um, Denise uh, Rezende saying, no questions today, just wanted to thank you and the moderators for the beautiful work you do. Following your work for three years, first time live. Oh, well, welcome. Uh, welcome. to. It's a different experience uh, being here live. Uh, I'm sure people in the chat will make you feel very welcome. And uh, moderators, uh, yes, I agree, absolutely. You do an amazing job. If you're there in the chat, do uh, show the moderators a bit of love because they do brilliant work. Um, Let's go to um, the question from Johnny Targs, um, also saying the moderators continue to kill it. Well done to them. Um, knowing what the fate is of Duncan Egg, Summerhall, is unique in storytelling, and the tones of the first three Duncan Egg novellas are somewhat on a lighter side even though they have faced danger and death in all three stories. My question is, will the tone continue to grow darker? I think of the Harry Potter series as those books grew darker and darker, or do you think George R. R. Martin will continue to keep it on the lighter side? Or do you feel the tones of the first th three novellas are dark already? Now, I don't think that the, the tone is not dark there. It's not dark, I think, because of the POV we're seeing it through. We're not dark. It's not dark partly because Dunk always tries to see the best in people, uh, partly because he doesn't always understand everything that's happening, um, and so he just will kind of blunders with good intentions into lots of different situations um, and tries his best. Um, partly he's a, he's a good person. Uh, we're there um, going through, yeah, he's he's got... Um, uh, flaws as every, anyone does, but that if you read a, a Cersei chapter in A Song of Ice and Fire, it's a very different feel to reading a Dunk chapter because you you're in Cersei's head, and so her thoughts are of revenge and her thoughts are, are thinking the worst of people and things like that. Dunk isn't like that. He's trying to help out. He's trying to save people. He's trying to do the right thing. So the character of Dunk is probably not going to change huge amounts. Uh, it will it will grow and develop and mature and lots of good things, I'm sure. But his overall approach to life and perspective is probably not going to change hugely. So I think the tone will remain lighter than A Song of Ice and Fire, but there, I think, will be no doubt that there will be some things which will start, pardon me, start to feel quite dark. I think some will certainly the end of it, that will be sad and tragic. Um, there will be some dark things going on there. I, I think the Harry Potter analogy is an interesting one because the idea there, as I understand it for J.K. Rowling when she was writing them, was the readers will be getting older as they go through this. Therefore, the you can um, you can make the stories more adult the further in you go. I don't think that's the case with George R. R. Martin. He is not here writing children's stories and then thinking later on that I'm going to be writing adult stories. That's not where his mind is at. This is uh, this is. And these are adult stories, but they're written in a tone that is a lot lighter. So um, I think the answer is no. But I'm also thinking across to the, the potential TV show. I do wonder if there's more of a potential there for that to happen. Because we're not inside the mind of Dunk on a TV show, we'll just be seeing what Dunk is doing. We won't get this you know, um, stream of consciousness happening all the time with his thoughts. And probably they will have to 
age up the actors. They will probably need to change the actors. Let's assume for one moment uh, that George R. R. Martin does write all of the 12 novellas or whatever it is, and we do get all of the 12 seasons of, of Duncan Egg. Let's imagine that happens. Um, when we get towards the end, we, we'll need to have middle-aged Duncan Egg, and it's probably not going to be the same actors that they have, whoever they cast, for child Egg and teenage dunk they it's not going to be filmed over that long period of time they will have to change over so maybe they film the first three five whatever then they get a new set of actors in the same way i think i used this example when i was talking about it a couple of weeks ago in the same way in the crown if you ever saw that on netflix where after two seasons they changed the actors who were the queen prince philip whoever Um, uh, Lucas Enyason, uh, probably mispronounced that. I do apologize, saying hey from Sweden. Hi, uh, thank you for all the amazing content you're creating. I couldn't have ended my birthday in a better way than with this live stream. Well, happy birthday to you! I hope you're having a fantastic day. Um, in Sweden, I'm not entirely sure which time zone Sweden is, but if you're um you're one hour ahead of me then this is the last few minutes of your birthday i hope you enjoy it and uh, and uh, are relaxing with a uh, a warming beverage of your choice i that's um uh thank you let's uh, let's pick up a few things in the chat um uh, we've Um, did Robert or oh, Andrew Case, did I get the super chat about the misinterpreted dragon dreams? No, I'm not sure I picked up on that one. Do apologize. I will see whether I can find that. Um, uh, James Scott saying we know that Dunk is related to Brienne, but do you see the mountain and hound also being relatives? I feel like there are a lot of parallels between the hound and Dunk. I, I don't, I think. Uh, I think Hodor probably is, but um, no, the Hound and the Mountain, other than the sort of the height and size, the the kind of imagery hints Joshua R. Martin gives for them um, are more to do with the possibility that in the same way that we talk about the Targaryens perhaps having some kind of gene-spliced dragony heritage in there somewhere he wants us to think of the hound and um the mountain as having this uh sort of like a bulldog or some sort of big animal kind of feel to it um it's all a bit dark it's all a bit nasty and mysterious but that's the uh that's the feel he gives for them Um, just having a quick look for that other. Um, oh, okay, yeah, I spotted here's the uh, the two super chats I missed. Sam Day saying Dunk versus Brienne, who wins? I think that's a draw. I really do. I think I I think that because of the fighting styles thing, I think that that's um, they will be. Uh, yeah, I think it's a draw. Um, and. Judy Simon saying, "Could egg? This must be the one." Uh, that you're asking whether I missed out on. Could Egg misinterpret his vision at Summerhall the same way Damon does in The Mystery Knight, thinking it's a real dragon when instead it's Rhaegar? Um, <coughs> yes. Yes. So the, the, the Summerhall, the imagery of Summerhall is very clear um, that this is giving birth to a dragon. That's what Egg is trying to do, give birth to a dragon. Um, and he's got all of the white things there. He's got some uh, fire priests. He's got some um, or fire mages. He's got some uh, lots of fire. He's got dragon eggs. Um, and there will be sacrifices, unintentional sacrifices, but there will be sacrifices. And what is born is a dragon. Rhaegar is born at the tragedy at Summerhall. So that is the imagery of what is going on there. Um, the question whether Dunk could be following some kind of dragon dream, I'd love this idea. 
we've not really seen uh, sorry if egg could have been trying to follow we've not really seen egg getting these dragon dreams but the fact that we get steer and the dreamer introduced so early and then also we get um uh, in the third novella the mystery night we we also get a uh, daemon there um he gets dragon dreams they dragon dreams appear a lot more in these Duncan Egg novels than they do in A Song of Ice and Fire. You do wonder whether this is leading up to the fact that Egg may do. So I like this idea. I like this idea a lot that this isn't just Egg going Targaryen y crazy, um, because that's one of the big shifts that has to happen in over these novellas. Egg starts off as this wonderful, innocent, nice child. He ends up as somebody who apparently is obsessed with hatching dragon eggs. So what happens there? Is this a slow move over that way? It, is, is there something that sort of triggers it? The idea that he starts getting dragon dreams is um, a, a, a very enticing one for me. I think that that works really well as a as a possibility. Um, question from Cloaked One. Um, this is picking up. Thank you. I love it when people do this. Uh, picking up for others. Uh, this is for Yellow, the True Yellow Dart, and Ryan Tierney. Do you think Dunk will ever confess to Egg that he was never knighted? Uh, perhaps before Egg adds him to the Kingsguard, who makes him Lord Commander. Yeah, I did have a question from one of my patrons. Um, uh, Lady of Summer said, do you think that it will be Egg when he becomes king that will be the one to truly knight Dunk? So, um, first of all, for those who are unaware of this, Dunk is very probably not actually technically a knight. I did a whole video on that if you're interested. Um, there's a lot of evidence for it. But it this is this is the setup really to the whole story. This is the first time we meet Dunk and immediately becomes pretty obvious when you perhaps not the first time you read it, but the second time you read through it, you go, oh hang on that's a, such a shift that happens. Scene one, we have Dunk, basically he's burying the body of Sir Arlen Pennytree. He was his squire and he's going, well, what am I going to do now? I mean, I could go off and um, like try and learn a trade somewhere. Or I could uh, join the army. And he's, he's thinking of all these things. And then that ends with saying, and I can't remember the exact phrase, but it's, and then he had an idea. Cut to the second scene, he's heading off to the tourney and telling everyone that he's a knight, that Arlen Pennytree knighted him. There is no evidence in that first scene that he had been knighted because the things he's thinking about were not things that a knight, a new knight would be thinking about. They they are not anything like And the fact that he had an idea, then the second scene we see him heading off uh, as a knight tells us, yeah, he's pretending that he's a knight. Um, which is this irony for this true and wonderful and noble character that at the heart of all of this is this lie, the idea that he's actually a knight. Um, and it comes back to him several times, most, I mean, most tellingly, I think, in that first one, when you get um, the... the Green Apple Raymond Fossaway wants to be knighted in order to take part in this uh, this uh, trial by seven, and it's Dunk who should knight him because any knight can knight another person. Um, but Dunk just kind of goes, mm, I, don't think, I don't think so. Maybe maybe someone else should. So I'm not, and that's very telling because he knows that he's not a knight really. And so he can't really make anyone else a knight, but he doesn't want to admit it in front of everybody. So that that's one of the great things about Dunk's character. I said, yeah, he has flaws. This is one. 
there's a lie at the very heart of who he is. But this also echoes across to rather wonderfully Brienne and also Sandor Clegane. There are echoes there too, where Brienne is the most knightly character in all of A Song of Ice and Fire. She does everything that a knight should do. She um, she upholds her vows. She protects the weak. All of these good things. But technically she's not a knight because she's a woman and nobody has ever knighted her. So although she is the most knightly, the true knight there is, she's not really actually a knight. And the same goes for Dunk. He is, generally speaking, this uh, this model of a true knight, but technically he's not actually a knight. So, to bring all of this back around to this question, is it possible, will he ever confess to Egg that he was never knighted? Um, could it be before Egg adds him to the King's Guard or makes him Lord Commander? I think, yeah. I think this will be a really touching moment when Egg, um, when Dunk has to confess, actually, you know what? I never was a knight. I think this is the only person he will admit it to. I think something will have to prompt it because he's kept this secret hidden for so long. I think being asked to be the model of for the entire Seven Kingdoms of what a knight should be is... Um, uh, maybe that's the kind of thing which will prompt Dunk to say, actually, you know what, I do need to be properly knighted. But in order for that to happen, I don't know. Anyway, I think the answer is yes. I, I, I think that there's a lot of work that will lead up to this, but Dunk has buried that deep. He doesn't even think about it. We, we see all of this from his POV. He doesn't really think about that so much. He he. He thinks about Sir Arlen Pennytree, but he doesn't think about whether he is a knight. Um, question from uh, Kutik Prabhu saying, if Dunk is a strong and the seed is strong, um, what is Dunk bo Dunk's boinking count so far? Um, so, so the strong thing is... Um, House Strong, who we will meet in the Dance of the Dragons, which is earlier than this story, um, for those uh, unsure of the Targaryen timeline there. So what we're going to see in House of the Dragon happens um, a long time beforehand, uh, before we get to, to Egg. So um, in that, we have House Strong, and we have, they are as the name implies, not all of them. Uh, Laris, uh, Laris Strong is obviously not, but we do know that they are generally big, strong fighter types. Might he come from that line? He does kind of fit the description. It's entirely possible. It would make sense, but I don't think we will know. In terms of his boinking count, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know what it is, um, but uh, he certainly does seem to be popular with the ladies. Let's put it that way. Uh, Ramon uh, Cavalcanti uh, saying, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, like the live and subscribe to that amazing channel. Greetings from Brazil. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very kind of you. Um, question from Cloaked One. This is, again, picking up for C. McBroom. Do you think we will ever get another low action story like the, uh, the Swan Sword? Not high stakes for the kingdom, but uh, giving us a better view of the matters that impact the small folk. Yeah, I mean, this is a thing that I really love about uh, Duncan Egg, is it does show us things from the small folk's perspective. The a Song of Ice and Fire is the story of the 1%. The, the people whose stories we're learning about are the sons and daughters of the noble lords and ladies of the realm or their knights themselves or something like that these are that's that's the level that we're talking about with dunk going around the seven kingdoms he is yes he does meet influential people but he's also just meeting the normal people as well and that's another part of how this feels uh, very different will we get another one i i wonder whether the village hero is is that he george R. martin is 
saying about how um, he sketched it out. The the she wolves of Winterfell seems very much like they're mixing in with uh, the the noble. I was going to say the noble lords and ladies, but in this case, it appears to just be the noble ladies uh, of of Winterfell. But the village hero. Um, does make it feel like they're sticking in a very small area and it's not about the nobles, it's just about what's happening in a, a small uh, village. So I, I hope so, because once Egg becomes king, then everything does magnify out to a much higher um, level. Um Uh, reflective around being saying popular but still humble and awkward, which helps with the popular bit. Yeah, that, that's certainly so. D Dunk isn't, uh, um, he's not really aware of his own charisma, I think, um, is the way that I would probably put that. Um, let's go to a question from. Uh, where are we up to? Sylvia Galasso saying, Ciao, Robert. Ciao. Do you POV characters in future books? Can you imagine if at some point we've got chapters from the perspective of Maester Aemon or Bloodraven? It would be too good to be true. Yeah, it would be fantastic. I would absolutely love it, but I think not. Um, one thing George R. R. Martin has kept with in uh, Duncan Egg is uh, he, he seems to treat the a novella effectively in the same way he treats a chapter of A Song of Ice and Fire. And the naming convention of chapters in A Song of Ice and Fire, you will already have picked up, is you get it's named after the person whose POV it is. And it starts out as being Arya or John or Tyrion or whatever. And then later on, it's it's increasingly becomes either sort of an alias. So we might have Cat of the Canals um, uh, or we might have... Um, reek or something like something like that where a, a, if a character's taking on a new alias then that might be what that cat that chapter's called but also sometimes it's it's a descriptor the the forsaken the spurn suitor that kind of thing where it's the pov is of that the descriptor is of the the pov person and he's kept that up with duncan egg it's from dunk's perspective and each of the the titles of the books or novellas, they're a reference to who Dunk is in that story. So Dunk is the mystery, <coughs> pardon me, the mystery knight or the hedge knight or something like that. Um, the, the I was for some time, I have to say, I was wondering whether we were going to see a change to this with the She-Wolves of Winter, Winterfell, because all of the other things that we read about, all of the other titles that we've we've heard, you know, the, the like uh, the Kingsguard, the, the champion, that all those, they, they seem to match up with uh, who Dunk is. Uh, but the She-Wolves of Winterfell, that seems to be talking about, or characters who aren't dunk so for a time i was wondering whether or not this did mean particularly as that was going to be going into dangerous women that the anthology whether we were going to see this story being from somebody else's perspective perhaps even a number of people's perspectives but george R. R. martin did clarify and that thing i said earlier uh read out earlier he did clarify that was just his working title it would be called something different so although we refer to the she wolves of winterfell that is not what it's going to be called it will be called something like i don't know the the, the I, i'm not even going to speculate but it will be it's a, a descriptor of who dunk is um at that point in time so is he a, a knight for hire or something i don't know that that kind of thing is is what we're going to get um all of which brings me around to answering the question, are we going to get POVs from other people? No. I think we're going to see all of this from Dunk's perspective, which means that because he doesn't always understand what he's seeing, um, that means that we will have to do a lot more interpretation of what, what events are happening um, 
rather than having someone like when you read a Tyrion chapter, for example, a lot of the time he's figuring out what's going on. He's he's telling us what's going on behind the actions of different characters. Dunk is Dunk doesn't do that. He just sees stuff. And then it's for us as a reader to try and interpret what it is that we've seen. Uh, Mark Shisa saying, Kingsguard equal model knights. Did I read a different book series? Uh, no, you did not. So what I meant there, sorry, I probably didn't explain. To Dunk and to most of the small folk, that is what the Kingsguard are supposed to be. So um, these kind of model knights, the greatest knights of the king. That's what they were set up to be. Um, it doesn't mean that they actually are in reality. George R. R. Martin loves the irony of the fact that these are supposed to be model knights, but they aren't. But to Dunk, he may well think that he ought to hit a certain standard, because that's the kind of person he is. Uh, I think that's me caught up in the chat. Um, Let's go to Lady Mays Mormont saying, Hello, Robert, can you put on your tinfoil hat for this? My biggest theory is that Bloodraven will do whatever he thinks is best for the realm by walking into Bran before he leaves the, the tree. Um, this way he'd be able to run the realm, given that Bloodraven does morally questionable things to generate better results. My question is, what evidence may we find to support that Bloodraven will do this in the Duncan Egg books? Um... Well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure whether I 100% buy into the tinfoil. I mean, I know you said put on your tinfoil hat, which I'm happy to. I'm not, so I'm not 100% sure I buy into that. What we will get increasing amounts of evidence for is Blood Raven doing what he thinks is right, regardless, um, and manipulating events behind the scenes. So that we will definitely get lots of evidence for. We will see. The um, probably the biggest example of this will be Anus Blackfire. Now, when Dunk, when there's a great council to decide who's who's going to be made king, and it ends up with Egg being made king, um, Anus Blackfire, who was the latest of the the Blackfire line, and the Blackfire line, let's not pretend they are Targaryens. They took on a different surname, but they are Targaryens. Um, Anus said, well, rather than me trying to invade, why don't I come over and try and put my case before the Great Council? And Bloodraven, as Hand of the King, said, yes, and you will have my guarantee on behalf of the, the King, on behalf of the Iron Throne, your safety is guaranteed. Anus came over and Bloodraven uh, arrested and killed him. <laughs> so... Uh, that meant that Egg's first act as king was to arrest Bloodraven and charge him with that and send him up to the wall. So that that's how all of that happened. And now that is Bloodraven doing what he thinks is the right thing, even though he knows that this is, you know, that's quite a quite a low and dirty trick to be guaranteeing someone's safety and then immediately killing them. Um so we will learn more about his character and his willingness to kill completely innocent people if he thinks that pushes forward his agenda. Um, will we get evidence that he walks into humans? That is an interesting one, because what we've seen so far, we've heard rumours in Duncan Egg that he can um, control wolves and birds and things like that we've not seen it yet we have seen we'll come on to maynard plum in a moment we've seen what appears to be a different kind of magic of him um taking on the appearance of glamouring himself to look like someone else i wonder whether we will see a gradual move more towards his um green seer magic over time and whether we will see moments of that and whether that will lead to more of a an approach to walking and skin changing rather than doing the glamouring that would be the thing that i would personally find fascinating um 
Zakalok saying uh, bonjour Robert bonjour uh, do you think we will have a book about the laughing storm and his relationship with dunk friend then foe then what question mark um so I don't think we will have a book specifically on the overall relationship the the laughing storm um Lionel Baratheon we met in book one in um, the Hedge Knight. He's there on the side of Dunk in the Trial of the Spy Seven. And he seems a great character. He's there in the tourney. Um, he's called the Laughing Storm because he's <laughs> laughing all the time. Uh, and he's he's a great fighter, one of the finest fighters of his age. And they have a bond, they have a connection. He will appear again later, and he will appear again because he becomes the Lord uh, of Storm's End. He is uh, the Baratheon Lord, and one of the things that Egg does when his uh, he's king is he decides, you know what, all of this Targaryens marrying each other, it's a bit icky, um, added to which it doesn't help us create any of these bonds with the other families that we're ruling. And so what he decides he wants to do is arrange marriages for all of his children, not with each other, but with influential families around the, uh, the country around the, around Westeros and the daughter of Duncan, uh, sorry, the daughter of um, Lionel Baratheon, the laughing storm is betrothed to Duncan Targaryen, who is the eldest son of Egg. No, yes, named after Dunk. Now, that would have brought an alliance between House Baratheon and the Targaryens, and all was going, going well until Duncan Targaryen broke it off because he fell madly in love with Jenny of Oldstones. We know where that whole story goes, but what the other side of this is that obviously Lionel Baratheon there is he's, he's angry. He was going to have his descendants sitting on the Iron Throne, and then suddenly nothing. And he gets so angry, he basically starts up a whole revolt and dunk has to ride to the rescue they fight each other dunk wins and uh egg eventually um uh sort of gives uh uh a sort of a a sympathy prize if it were that's probably the wrong way of saying it but this is the way it was intended uh that they do get they get Rayella or Rael marries into the Baratheons and that is where we get the claim that Robert Baratheon got that he's got a Baratheon grandmother so that's where that all comes from and um will we see the a whole the whole relationship no but we will see almost certainly we will see that as a novella because that is such a, a a moment in Dunk's life, and let's not forget, although Egg becomes king, these are stories about Dunk. We, we're seeing things from Dunk's perspective, so we will that battle is an important moment for him. So, um, he will be, um, uh, uh yes, yeah, so we're going to see that. I, I did also just just what I thought the reason I was pausing was I just had this other thought when people were asking about Dunk going to the wall, I just remembered. We do know Dunk did go to the wall, actually. Not to, during the, the stories that when Egg was a child, but Dunk went to the wall at the same time as Bloodraven and Maester Eamon. This is a sort of a throwaway remark uh, that we I think Eamon comes up with it in Song of Ice and Fire, and he says that um, he was sent, Dunk was sent to the wall to escort Maester Eamon to the wall. And so Dunk does go up there. So maybe he will, maybe that's the point at which he discovers his father or, or whether his father's there or not. It certainly would make for a quite a fun 
if that's the point at which they get up to the to the wall if he'd wanted to go to the wall when he was much younger and then finally he gets this opportunity and maybe this is egg rewarding him in a way and saying okay you can now finally go up there um Question from Casey S saying, sorry for being off topic, but have you read or would you ever review Berserk? Uh, thanks for being great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think I know Berserk. I don't know who uh, wrote it. I'm always happy for recommendations. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you want to drop it in after this is finished, if you leave a comment down there. Um, uh, then I very happily pick that up. I don't tend to do reviews of uh, of um, just random books. Maybe in the future I will. Um, uh, but yeah, always looking for good books. Cloaked One picking up question for Phoenix Milburn. Can you please do a one-time return to Ibn in A Traveller's Guide to Essos? Did I not do Ibn? I might not have. Um, okay, yeah. I mean, one thing I've been meaning to do for a while is... Um, there are a couple of random places that I th I think to myself, actually, I didn't ever cover that when I did the Traveller's Guides. If you don't know what the Traveller's Guides are, this is a series I did a long time ago, three, four years ago, maybe. Um, it was a very long-running series of videos, just short videos, but a Traveller's Guide to Westeros. Go, what does it feel like for a, a traveller to visit a place? Um what what does it look like? What does it smell like? How does it feel? Um, how big is it? Or these kinds of things that we often just get sort of descriptions, but at a real base level, what's it what's it like as a place? Um, and I did all around Westeros and all around Essos. Um, and yeah, I think having looked back, there are a few different places. I think there are a couple of places north of the wall that I didn't go to, and I didn't cover a lot of um, uh, sort of the Sothorius and 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 the, those kinds of places that perhaps I could have done, and I have, <coughs> pardon me, I have been wondering whether to do a couple of them for um, patrons, just as a sort of a little thank you uh, to patrons. I, I do uh, try and do a few. I haven't for a while. Um, forgive me, patrons. Uh, provided additional content, um, but yeah, I've I've had the thought to do that. Um, if you, which is a wonderful segue, unintentional segue into uh, saying, if you do wish to support this channel or get access to some random extra things that I do provide for my patrons from time to time, uh, the best way to do that is through Patreon. There is a link down in the description. That's why I prioritize my, uh, questions from patrons. That's one of the perks for being a patron. Any patron can get priority questions for these live streams. Um, and patrons, thank you. Uh, I cannot do what I do without your support. So thank you. I hugely appreciate it. Um, uh, Beesman uh, with um, what looks like a very generous super chat. Thank you very much. I don't know. I don't know what currency that's in, but thank you that looks very uh, very generous of you uh, side note about eggs last reread i focused on varus and i'm more and more convinced varus is egging uh, so to say if he stopped shaving lush silver hair would appear his father is aaron's least bastard his real name is varus with an extra e anywhere uh, i mean it's an, it's an interesting theory there is um and, and it's, this is one of those things that I have been trying to keep half an eye on. I'm doing a reread of the way through. I did, uh, I tried to sort of tweet my way through when I was doing book one, uh, which I did tweet my way through book one. Uh, I've gone through, I'm going through book two now, um, listening to it rather than reading it, um, which gives you a slightly different perspective. This is one of the things that I have in the back of my mind, just been trying to think about this idea of, do we have any clues about Varys's identity? The when we first meet him, it's there. There is lots of imagery there. When we first meet him, he comes in uh, and meets a cat, basically um, uh, in um, King's Landing when she comes down. And first of all, he is described as an egg. Um, 
Now, let's not forget, Duncan Egg hadn't been written, probably not conceptualized at that point. So, um, yes, Aegon Egg was a Targaryen name, but I think the link across to Duncan Egg probably wasn't there at that point. But also, she thinks beforehand, she thinks the on only people who know uh, all of the secrets of the Red Keep and how to get in and out are the Targaryens themselves. And then Varys appears, I know all the secrets of the in ways in and out of, of the Red Keep. And it's like, Oh, are you trying to say that you are a Targaryen? There's a hint there. The fact that he does keep his head close shaved is certainly an, a, a thing. Um, there are there are hints there. I've not yet seen enough for me to go and say, yes, there's evidence for this yet. Maybe there will be at some point. Um, the, the link across to, um, we know Illyrio, obviously, the... The thinking there is very much that it's his son um, who is Fagon and he's linked in with the Blackfires. Perhaps is, is Varys actually also part of that family in some way? It's possible. Um, so there are possibilities, but I'm not yet content enough to say that there is a strong case here. If that changes when I'm on my reread, then I will let you know. That there's also, I mean, a lot of these are, are people, Targaryens. Tyrion Targaryen is another theory that I'm just keeping in the back of my head as I'm reading through. Is there actually any evidence of it when we're going through again? Um, but Varys as well, you can say, yes, def definitely. That's a, um, if you added in an E to that somewhere, then it would sound very much like a Targaryen name. Um, and you said the other thing, Arian's least bastard. George R. R. Martin has confirmed, yes, so Arian um, being uh, Egg's uncle, I think, um, who he was not, he was a nasty piece of work. Um, he was the one who attacked Tansel, and then Dunk came in and tried to save the day. Um, but he, at the end of his life, he downed a a pint of wildfire thinking it would turn into a dragon it didn't and it killed him so um he went off into exile for a while in lease and george R. martin has basically said yeah he did have bastards out there so he's not given the hint that there's there's any link across just to say yes there is there are targaryens out there we shouldn't think or people with um targaryen heritage we shouldn't think that the the characters we know with Targaryen heritage are the only ones. There are many others who have smaller, but uh, still definitely there, hints of Valyrian to them. Um, Caius Ballerina picking up for Dominican Stud 101. Um, thank you very much. Saying which characters from the main books were alive during the Duncan Egg stories. Um, I will tie this one in, I think, with... A question. Uh, I can't remember. I will. It's one of my questions from uh, from my patrons, which I shall come to at some point. Which was asking about: Are we likely to see any more? The Duncan Egg stories take place over uh, decades, so um, it's it's not a straightforward answer. In at the, this moment in time, we have got. Blood Raven, who we obviously know, but it's just the people who are very old who make appearances. We will definitely see Maester Eamon. He is around. Um, we've got um, Walder Frey makes an appearance as a rather snotty and annoying child um, in the um, Mystery Night. So he is there. Probably we will see Old Man when they uh, get up to Winterfell. So the, the characters who are really old, we will definitely see. When Duncan Egg get older, we will start to see even more characters who we know in their younger days. So obviously we will see people like um, the Mad King, Aerys II, before he was the Mad King. What was he like? That's going to be absolutely fascinating. Um, I talked about uh, what Egg's plan to marry his children off to uh, various uh, different important families. 
one of the people that he was trying to marry into his family was Elena Tyrell, um, or she became Elena Tyrell later. Um, she uh, looks back on it, has memories of the Targaryens are being a bit weird. Um, it appears that, I think it's Deeran was his name, um, that a particular person she was matched up with seems to have been gay. And so she obviously just wanted to get out of that and was quite happy when it collapsed. So um, she never was married to him. Um, and instead, she got married into the Tyrells. So we will see a lot of these characters in their younger days. The interesting ones to keep a look for will be people who there's no reason why we necessarily should see them, but they probably were around people like Tywin Lannister that I'm hugely looking forward to if we do, because Tywin Lannister was friends with Aerys in his uh, his younger days. So um, we may well see a young Tywin Lannister, which would be fantastic. Cloaked one picking up. Um, oh, actually, you picked up for the same question, actually, Cloaked one and uh, Carlos Berlioz. Thank you very much. Um, uh, question I think I had another one Matthew Kidd saying will Egg be knighted and will Egg insist that Dunk knights him even though Egg will have figured out Dunk wasn't really knighted himself um, oh that's an interesting way maybe um, may, maybe that, that is a way way through this that Egg does get um, he, he does fight in um, wars at Dornish, at Dornish insurrection or the Dornish marches he heads off to. We know that. Um, so um, will Egg uh, insist or want Dunk to knight him and then Dunk won't knight him and then maybe that's how it ends up. Maybe maybe that's how it is. It's um, In any event, it's going to be between them because I think the only person that Dunk will trust to um, actually knight him and keep his secret is Egg. Uh, Andrew K saying, I'm guessing Varys's bloodline is likely special for that sorcerer to covet um, and what he did, um, whether it's being the female line of Blackfire or whatever. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, this is another thing which is suggestive. <coughs> Pardon me, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, so Varys's backstory, obviously, then he had his private parts, a root and stem taken off and uh, burned on the fire, and then a voice came out. So this was part of some kind of magical ritual. And he claims that basically he was just a nothing picked up off of the street. He was uh, um, joined the mummers. Um, but uh, it makes some sense for this to be him having some king's blood to him or something um again it's suggestive rather than final evidence of anything but um it is it's definitely there i'm, I'm keeping an eye out for it um jewel elson saying phoenix milburn asking cloaked one to ask in deep geek about the wall uh Phoenix Milburn wants to know what Indeep Geek thinks about how many men would be needed to properly and fully man the wall. Um, uh, I think we have a figure somewhere. I don't. I can't remember off the top of my head. I will. I will answer this one properly next week. Um, but it's a lot more than they have right now. It's it's thousands. The um, the question is what fully and properly man it actually means because you. At the moment, they have got a few hundred. Um, I think there's 400-ish. Uh, a couple of hundred go off in the Great Ranging. Um, they, um, they only keep three of the 17 um, forts on the wall manned, and those are not full by any means. The night fort is massive. I think off the top of my head, the night fort could house 2,000 uh, men. Um, so we're talking thousands. I don't know if there's an official number out there, but it's a, it's a lot. 
um, if you were going to fill all of the forts. But you wouldn't have to fill all the forts. It's just a matter of um, what level of coverage you want. I mean, what is manning the war fully? It's uh, making sure that somebody's on watch across the entire wall. Does that mean you have uh, a member of the Night's Watch one a mile, or do you have them one, you know, or what? So I think it's that there's a lot of imponderables there, but it is a large number that theoretically could be there. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll um, I'll pick up and then have a look, and I'll I'll come back next week. Remind me if uh, if I don't next week. Let's go to a question from Launduck20 saying, Hi, Robert. Do you think we'll ever see Maynard Plum, a.k.a. Blood Raven, again? Um, also, do you think Walter Walter Frey will make another cameo? Um, and George R. R. Tolkien uh, also asking, saying, Salutations, Robert. I had two questions, um, one for the live stream, um, uh, the other for you. The, the one about the live stream is... Uh, what was going on with Maynard Plum. So, um, Walder Frey, will we see him again, possibly in the Riverlands, if we've got the village hero thing? It, that's going to be set in the Riverlands. Um, maybe we'll see him again there, but probably not. There, there's no particular reason why we should. As for Maynard Plum, th this is in the Mystery Night, and this is a fantastic, again, this is George R. R. Martin doing show don't tell. Maynard Plum is uh, a sellsword who appears uh, to be there and comes to the tourney along with the tourney at White Halls, White Walls, along with everyone else. Doesn't actually take part in the tourney himself, but just sort of like hangs around. Is a bit suspicious on various different ways, uh, and then at the end disappears and. Blood Raven appears. Now, lots of people have said this is almost certainly Blood Raven in disguise, having glamoured himself as this this Maynard Plum. Um, but Maynard Plum, it has to be said, he, he claims to be from House Plum and a distant cousin. So it's like nobody could possibly know whether he's a real person or not. Um, why do we think it might be Blood Raven? Well. The first thing is that there is something going wrong with him. Dunk, when he looks at him, he, he says uh, that there is something queer about his features. And the more he looked, the less he saw. So that immediately that makes you think, OK. Then he has got this clasp that apparently looks like an eye. Blood Raven, obviously, a thousand eyes and one. Um, and... That's making go, making go. Okay, maybe that's it. When Blood Raven does appear, he's clearly he clearly knows what has been going on, as if he had been there. Maynard Plum, which is a bizarre choice of thing to do, given the the people who are there, actively seems to be defending Blood Raven when somebody like says, "Oh, that Blood Raven is not great." Um, he witnesses somebody saying bad things about Blood Raven, and then mysteriously that person gets captured and killed. And he also, for reasons that we're not made very aware of, he basically tries to get Dunk to get out of there with Egg, because Blood Raven would know who Egg was. Um, he tries to say, now, now's the time. You just leave here just in case anything bad happens. Uh, he seems to uh, be part of trying to make sure that Egg is kept in a safe place when all of the problems happen. Everything seems to add up to this idea that this is probably Blood Raven in disguise, keeping an eye on what's going on. And why is this important? Because this actually, it, said, it was pretending to be attorney, but really this is a gathering of people for a nascent rebellion. This is uh, the Damon uh, Blackfire, who is uh, his son, who is coming across to start the second Blackfire rebellion. This is uh, Blood Raven stopping it. So that's what's almost certainly what's happening with Maynard Plum is that it is Blood Raven. Will we see him again? Um, 
Probably not, but it's possible given the fact that Dunk didn't seem to figure out what was going on. If uh, if Bloodraven had thought that uh, that Dunk knew who that was, probably he wouldn't use that disguise again. And there's no reason why he couldn't use a completely different disguise. I, I as I've said as well, I think there's a chance we will see Bloodraven increasingly be starting to move away from normal sorcery and more towards the green seer end of things as these stories progress um George R. R. Tolkien you also just asked me about the boys uh I I love the boys I haven't I'm not up to speed on season three yet uh I hear great things about it if you've not watched the boys I would actually really recommend it it's um one of the best things on tv at the moment in my view it grows on what it grew on me it starts out as being this is a superhero thing then it's oh okay so maybe the superheroes aren't all good um but the plot and the story and the characters are really top-notch so um yeah i, I i'm enjoying it uh click to one picking up um Question for Thomas de Kirschmecker. When will we see a hairy egg? Will we see him dye it blue like young Griff or just um, rock the Targaryen uh, cut? Well, that's interesting. So when will he start growing out his hair? When he no longer has to pretend not to be a Targaryen. Um, now... I, it's not clear is the short answer, but there there does come a point when um, he's called Aegon the Unlikely because he was the fourth son of a fourth son. He was, I, I don't know the exact, something along the lines of 16th, 15th, 16th in line to the throne. He was not going to inherit, which was why the powers that be were okay for him to just be wandering around the Seven Kingdoms. But there came a point when uh, suddenly... Uh, he his father was the heir and he and his siblings were were all brought to king's landing and basically said right now you have to stay here um you can't go off and do your own things because this is the family now needs you here that at that point probably he will be able to grow out his hair the question is whether he would have done it earlier um we don't know how long he does spend we know it's years how long he does spend with dunk wandering around and will he perhaps at some point in that decide i mean he could decide to grow it and dye his hair he doesn't have to be shaved head all the time um so definitely before he's king uh, a few years before he's king but maybe a bit before that um Kieran Grant saying, I binge-watched all seasons of The Boys last weekend, and season three is amazing. Um, uh, yeah, I had only good things about it. Um, Matt Savino saying, Egg just says one day, yeah, Blood Raven is really about trees these days. Yeah, that might, maybe that's how we're going to be um, uh, going with it. Um, Andrew Kay saying, notice Plum's gemstone brooch, moonstone to be exact, glamour very much on the cards, it seems. Yeah, and it looks like an eye. That's the uh, that's the interesting thing, like one eye. Uh, another hint about this. Uh, okay, so let's go to a question from Catherine Furseth. Uh, I wonder which will be the main parts of the eventual complete Duncan Egg stories that will provide us with the most important insight and backstories for the main story of A Song of Ice and Fire. The story of Blood Raven is one, Summer Hall, another. Which are your favourites, or are you looking forward to the most? Um, yes, to both of those. Uh, those are the two things that I'm looking forward to most. Summer Hall, definitely, I want to know exactly what happened there, because George R. R. Martin has made it a mystery. Um, and then, uh, secondly, and, and the build-up to that, because we we will get the cast starting to gather we will see we've got dunk we've got egg we will see um 
His son, Duncan, we will start to meet Jenny of Oldstones. The Woods Witch is going to appear. Eris is going to be around. All of the cast who are going to be gathered there will start to appear over the two or three stories before that, and they come together for Summer Hall. So that's that's something I'm really looking forward to. Um, Blood Raven, yes, definitely learning as much as we can about Blood Raven as a person. What's he like? Particularly his relations to his other siblings. We've not really seen Chira Sea Star yet. Might we? Might we get a glimpse of her? Perhaps it's possible. That would be quite good. So some of these other characters, the relations that we we sort of missed the chance for the the relations uh, between Blood Raven and Agor Rivers and Damon Blackfire and things like that. That would have been great, but that's out of scope, unfortunately. Um, but who Blood Raven is and what he does, that's the um, that's something I'm really looking forward to. And the other, which I kind of touched on before, is this character study of a Targaryen. We've not had this so far. We've not had the longitudinal study of a Targaryen life before. We often just sort of talk about Tar yeah, Targaryens having like, the dragon sickness, they're go going mad, all of these kind of things. But we've not, we've not seen it over a long period of time. We heard about it. We've heard that Aerys in his younger days, Aerys II, was... He was quite a good, nice person. And then later on, he became the Mad King. This is a first-hand account of a Targaryen who, in his younger day, he does he comes across egg. Yes, yes, we like him as a character. He does come across as a bit entitled, um, and does sometimes, um, I wouldn't say deserve the clout in the air, but he he does sort of push his luck sometimes, and um, uh, because he comes from that position of, of great privilege and thinking that he is above the Targaryens, think that they're above everyone else. So um, how do we get from that to the person who is so obsessed by dragon eggs that they set fire to an entire palace and it burns down and he kills half the family? How do we get from those two places, between place A and place B? I, I don't know, but I'd be fascinated um, to see. Um, let's go to a question from Alejandro Martinez saying, Hi, Robert. Good afternoon. Unable to join for the live stream. We'll catch up on the rewatch. Uh, hi there. Um, do you think Dunk will have to reconcile his knightly values or vows with children he be uh, we believe he might sire? Brienne is a descendant, maybe Hodor. We often think of Dunk as the true knight, even though he's most probably not yet knighted. Um, how does that square, if at all, with him potentially having natural-born children? We know he eventually becomes a member of the King's Guard, and don't they swear oaths not to have children? I love how George R. R. Martin captures this genuine and sincere innocence to Dunk, especially in his thoughts. Yeah, so it's an interesting one. The the King's Guard do about we're, we're never told exactly what the King's Guard vows are. We just get, I think it's Jamie who just also they make you vow swear so many different things, so many different vows, and we get a few references to keeping the king's secrets and uh, being willing to give your life for the king and things like that. Um, we get a couple of examples. So, so Barristan and Aris Oakheart both think of um when they think of their oaths they think of the the need for celibacy uh, to be chaste they are both quite prudish characters so they would think of that but it does seem to suggest that the king's guard yes do have to make that kind of um oath knights generally don't as far as we can tell they the oath that they swear um, is to do with protecting the innocent and things along those lines. It's not to do with, like, the Night's Watch oath of you know, not siring any children or nothing. So Dunk is absolutely fine about having uh, um, having lots of children. Only when he gets to the King's Guard might that prove to be an issue. So I don't think that there's a there's an issue for him in terms of his morality. Um, clearly, he doesn't think that there's a problem at all. Um, and it could potentially create some tension if 
Um, when he gets to the King's Guard, he then does want to sleep with someone. So we're getting this list when he's going around. Um, we're getting this list of Tansel Tutul, uh, Rohan Weber. There will surely be others of, of people who will by then be in his past, but still dear to his heart. What have they come calling? Um, that's exactly the kind of thing John George R. R. Martin loves uh, a heart in conflicts with itself. If he has taken those vows and then suddenly somebody that he has loved for, uh, ever since his younger days appears before him, what is he going to do? It's interesting when we think of Duncan Egg in the latter years, we often think about the egg driven stuff because he's the king, of course. But there will be stories that aren't recorded in the history books that are about what Dunk was up to. There are long periods of time when we know what Egg was doing. Um, we know the politics that he was playing, but we don't really know what Dunk was up to. So, yeah, who, who knows? There could be lots of stories in there. Um Jenny Bird saying, um, in the Duncan Egg stories, we've already met the younger version. I think this was the question I was uh, I was going for. Um, uh, you, uh, I said, somebody else asked something in the chat. Um, this is about which younger characters might we meet. Um, and you say you'd love to meet a young lady, Elena, but don't know if that makes sense. And yes, I think we are going to meet a young um, uh, lady, Elena, that which would be fantastic. Um couple more questions now um, from my patrons. So I've only got a couple more left. So now is a good time if you have some more questions to drop them into the chat and I will try my best to get to as many of them as I can. Andrew Quaid, can you discuss more of Maester Eamon's role in Blood Raven's plans? I've always wanted to know more about why he felt his place was at the wall and what role he might have played in events. He was also close with Egg, so we, uh, will we see him in the upcoming stories? I really hope we will learn more about him. Yes, we will almost certainly meet him in the stories. Um, he is there as a maester. He's there in Dragonstone for a while. And then when we get to the Great Council that eventually chose Egg, Aemon was their first choice. Uh, a lot of people wanted Aemon to be the king, and he turned it down. And he said no, he didn't want that. And we get this in, uh, I think it's the first John chapter of Clash of Kings. Aemon talks a lot about this kind of history, or, or it might even be um, uh, John Mormont. Uh, but he, as a as a, a person who loved Egg, realised that given the fact that he had been offered the kingship, when Egg was king, he if he hung around as an advisor, people would always see him as a possible alternative king, regardless of what um, whether he wanted it or not. And that would always be a distraction for Egg. So he saw he thought to himself he had to absent himself from that debate that was the best way that he could help egg and he thought okay well he's got his one vow as a maester if he goes to the night's watch and makes that vow as well um and he's completely out of sight out of mind all of that will add up to being a best way of not um being a distraction and he could carry on with uh discussions by correspondence so that's when he says his place is at the wall. That's that's the main part of it. The question is the extent to which he's got some kind of magical thought here. And it, there does seem to be. He does seem to get dragon dreams of some kind. And he does think that that is his place. The I don't think we're going to see it in Duncan Egg. We might see some, uh, but I don't think we're going to see a huge amount. But the relationship between... Uh, Maester Aemon and Bloodraven is fascinating because they spent, I think, something like 13 years at the wall together. And we know that Aemon was incredibly learned, knew a huge amount about things he had. The, the library at the Castle Black is actually very, very good. 
uh, when Sam goes in there, he's astonished by it, by all of the different things they've got in there. Blood Raven, clearly huge amounts of knowledge and uh, and power. The relationship between those two will be fascinating to see, and I hope we do get to see some of it. As I say, we did have Dunk going up to the wall with the two of them, so maybe we'll we will see some of that. Um, I don't know. So. Um, in terms of what Eamon and why he saw his place there, there has always been this hint that he just knew, probably through his dreams or something, that that was where he should be. And so it turned out. He he was definitely, he, he survived uh, Robert's Rebellion because of where he was, and he played a very important role with both John and Sam in the events of A Song of Ice and Fire. So... Um, he was right. There are two levels um, on that one. Question from Carlos Ballerina saying, I found some Dunk tinfoil for you. Duncan the Tall was the heir to Harrenhal. Jane Lothan's, uh the mum of the bastards of Harrenhal. A said boy hooks up with Donnell in the tourney of 193, and this makes Dunk. Um, well, I mean, I don't... That, that's... Good tinfoil. Uh, so House Lothston, the context for those who don't know this house, they were the lords of Harrenhal before House Went. House Went were the family who had it at the time of the tourney at Harrenhal, uh, so just before the um, Robert's Rebellion. Now, House Lothston lost it because they got involved in sorcery and witchcraft, apparently, and it was decided that they should get chucked out of there and all killed. Now, this, the idea that perhaps she was um, his mother, uh, Jane Lothston's the mum of the bastard of Harrenhal, and the boy hooks up with Donnell in the tourney of 193 and makes Dunk. Um, so kind of I, I get it the reason why i like it I, and i should probably say i don't see any direct evidence for that i'm very happy if somebody points out some direct evidence for it i would love to see it this does go into something that um again i think i talked about it briefly a couple of weeks ago but i this is a fascinating thing about dunk is that he is non-magical that's pretty clear to i think everything we see about him he's not a magical person however he is some sort of magical catalyst or some sort of catalyst of great events in some way this is it's more than a coincidence he goes to um all of these events that change history the the tourney at ashford meadow would have just been a normal tourney but for Dunk being there and him stepping in to uh, to save Tansel and then the trial by seven that um, that led to the death of the crown prince, um, that which was clearly important. Then him being down with Dunk in Dawn actually seems like not much, but it meant that they survived the great spring sickness, which killed a huge proportion of everybody except for people who were in Dawn, because it didn't reach down into Dawn. The, then the Mystery Knight, they were just going along to this uh, random tourney, and it turns out this isn't a random tourney. They've got themselves into the middle of an entire rebellion. And Blood Raven, it, you can sense he sees something in Dunk. In the Mystery Knight, he's there, and he's just, why are you here? What's... What's going on? Why Why are you here? And that same kind of feeling builds on the fact that he knew what happened with uh, the tourney, tourney at Ashford Meadow. Um, and Dunk, when he was a child, he remembers when Blood Raven came in on the back of a horse into the city, riding through Flea Bottom, and then just turns and looks at Dunk as if he sees there's something about that person over there. There is something about Dunk. He is not magical, but he is he's a locus of some kind. And that makes sense if he comes down from some kind of magical line. So um, 
there's no evidence for it, I, I think is where I would come from, but it's it's certainly possible. I do like it's good tinfoil. Uh, reflective rambling, uh, picking up for Anthony Marconi. Traveller's Guide got me through lockdown. Um, Anna K, I, I, that makes me very happy. Thank you very much. Anna K, hi from Krakow. Uh, will listen when gardening. Thank you for all you do. Love your content and voice. Thank you very much. I hugely appreciate that. Um, and reflective rambling again, picking up for Itrith. On Garo saying, if it wasn't for you, I'd not be as invested as I am on A Song of Ice and Fire. Excellent work. Uh, thankful I found this years ago. Very relaxing voice. Thank you uh, very much. I, I hugely appreciate that. And if I can get people into being invested in it um, and enjoying the content, then, um, yeah, that's great. Um, Cast Ballerina picking up for Jervis Germain. Um no one knows how old Dunk is, but he was five to six when Sir Arlen took him and is 16 to 17 in the Hedge Knight. Baylor Breakspear says his joust with Sir Arlen was nine years past. So Dunk should have already been there for that joust. Whose memory is faulty, Baylor, Dunk or George? Or is Baylor making his version up on the spot to help Dunk? Um, I don't know. It's the short answer. My guess is probably George. Um, he does make small mistakes, um, and uh, this is the kind of one where you could imagine it, and and you can write it off as uh, as a character slip of the uh, slip of the mind. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for that. Again, I'll have a look into that. There was one earlier that I will look into, but I will have a look into this. If I get a better answer than that, I will very happily um, uh, come back next week and tell you. Um, question, last question from one of my patrons. Um, this is from Gabriel Farrell saying, I'll ask about Dunk's foot. We've got all this way without talking about Dunk's foot. Um, is he going to score that? This is football uh, references for those who are non-football people. Is he going to score the winner in the Westeros FA Cup final? Or do you reckon, George, or do you reckon, um, George R. Martin might pull the rug from under us all in a classic Red Wedding style and have it actually be a header. Um, okay, so this is, and I talked about the fact that there are some things in Duncan Egg that are not necessarily foreshadowy, but they're just, this is the way that Doug just, uh, Dunk just keeps on thinking through things in a sort of a circular style. Circular style. Um, but this is definitely foreshadowing the when he rescues Tancel, then uh he he kicks basically he kicks um Arian and if you lay a hand or foot on a prince then that gets chopped off um but because he, you know, this this escalates into this being a trial by seven, and he gets vindicated in this, he does not lose his foot. So, at the end of this, he then is like, lying, sort of lying back, pondering life, and he starts thinking, what, what is it about this foot? Um, why, why? Why is this foot so special? This this foot was cost the life of a prince because in the uh, crown prince this was um, in the trial by seven. Uh, Baylor Breakspear dies, um, and it's Dunk's foot, and he draws the comparison between the death or life of the crown prince, and therefore by sort of wider implication the seven kingdoms with his foot. And he doesn't let it drop. He thinks that thought again two, three other times in the other stories. He said, what is it? What's about my foot? Why, why is my foot so important? Is my foot going to do something um, to make it worthwhile? Um, uh, somebody died for this foot. Surely this foot needs to do something. So he can't really get it out of his head. And I, I did do a video on dunk's foot as well if you're interested um the it definitely is 
leading up to something. And it's the equivalence there of Dunk's Foot and the life of the Crown Prince, uh, Dunk's Foot and the Seven Kingdoms itself. What is Dunk going to do with his foot that is possibly going to balance that in some way? And the obvious answer is that this, as the thing that started these stories off, is how this is going to end these stories. Summer Hall. Now, I don't know exactly how this is going to happen. There are echoes of Hodor in what I'm going to say in a moment, which, if Hodor is indeed Dunk's uh, descendant, make a huge amount of sense. But the tragedy at Summer Hall killed almost everyone. Dunk did something heroic. That much we know. Um, if it weren't for the actions of Lord Commander, dot, 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 this is one of the small fragments of information we have about what happened in Summer Hall. So he did something heroic. And what else do we know about the outcome of all of this is that Rhaegar was born. Now, a heavily pregnant woman about to give birth is probably not the person who is best placed to be able to escape from a, a towering palace of Inferno, unless they had been helped to escape by someone like Dunk, who all the time is keeping an eye out to try and help the weak, those who are not able to help themselves. This would be absolutely within character for Dunk to throw himself into a stupid situation in order to save the life of a pregnant woman. How might he do that? Maybe he puts his foot in a door to stop it slamming shut so that they can escape. Something as simple as that. And that saves the life of the unborn at that point, Prince Rhaegar, and a crown prince balancing, the life of a crown prince balancing the life of a crown prince. And Rhaegar's actions, in a way, in the longer term, you could argue they will save the Seven Kingdoms, which again is where Dunk's mind goes originally there. So that, I think, is is where this is going to end up. Exactly how George R. R. Martin does it, we, we, he simply hasn't given us the information. He's given us so little about Summer Hall, but some facts we know. We know that Dunk does something heroic. We know that he dies, probably in the act of doing that something heroic. We know that Rhaegar survives, um, is is born and survives. Um, and we know that Dunk thinks that his foot somehow owes the life of a crown prince. So add those things together, it creates an image, a picture, um, the details of which we don't know. But I think this is where George R. R. Martin is taking us. Uh, Sena. Hello, Jürgensen. Uh, thank you very much for the super sticker. Um, reflective rambling, picking up from Matt Savino. Do you think the tall man that Bran saw kissing a woman through the Winterfell weirwood was Dunk? Yes, I did uh, vaguely reference this ages ago. Um, Dunk, sorry, Dunk. Bran, when he's getting his first weirwood visions, um, he has the weirwood paste. And he goes and has weirwood visions going back in time through looking at the Winterfell weirwood. Now, we know they're back in time because we can see with some of them, we do know what they are. Um, the, there is one of a, a woman on her tiptoes kissing a very tall knight that fits in roughly the right time period for when Dunk is at Winterfell, we know, with the she-wolves of Winterfell. And this also fits with the fact that this is Bran, he seems to, the control he has over his weird visions at that time is limited. It's just like scrolling through. But it seems to be people he's connected to in some way. He sees his father. He sees his uncle Benjen. Um, this, if this is old man, that makes sense. 
Um, so this works out well. It gives us a reason for perhaps how um, Hodor is, who is very tall, obviously, is a descendant of um, Dunk, if he and old man, young man, um, had a bit of a fling at the time, then that all makes sense. So we do not know, but everything points to it. So um, almost certainly, and this is, again, this is the, um, this is quite a very dunk thing, is that if, if he's going into this place where the focus of this story is on all of these very important and powerful women, and actually the woman that he falls for is the wet nurse or, or um, a, a simple servant. So that would make uh, quite a lot of sense because he doesn't necessarily go for the highborn person every time. Uh, Dominican Stud 101 saying, have you thought about making a football channel or videos? It comes up a lot in the live streams, but you always change the subject. I want to hear you talk footy. Well, that, I do change the subject. Because, yes, I am a football fan. Um, uh, but uh, I know that this is stream about Song of Ice and Fire or, or Lord of the Rings or whatever. So um, I try and keep it on topic. Um, uh, I have had many various thoughts about other channels that I could do. Yes, football is one that I would happily do. And at some point I will branch out. Um, definitely do not worry about that. Um, yeah, uh, I, I have many thoughts about football. Um, I'm a Manchester United fan, which means I have particularly large amounts of thoughts about things right at this moment. Uh, but we're not going to go in there. Um, Caius Ballerina, um, how is Dunk related to Brienne? if not through Tarth's unspecified connection to the Targs. Many think a Tarth marries a pregnant sister of Egg. Um, possibly. Uh, we don't know. So his his shield is there in Tarth, which seems to imply that he visited. Um, I, I do wonder... Um, I mean, Tarth is an odd... but It's an island off the east coast of... Westeros, when might he have done that? There are a couple of times when he might have been by that way, um, both when he's in the Kingsguard, when he maybe went to fight the Laughing Storm, maybe it was during the Blackfire Rebellion that he uh, helped put down. Uh, so maybe on both of those occasions, he he could feasibly have gone via Tarth. Um, but it's, a sort, it's an odd, slightly out-of-the-way destination. Um... Might he be connected by uh, a Tarth marries a pregnant sister of Egg? Yes, this is entirely possible because, um, uh, and this is linking up to the, um, I, I think one of the quickfire questions I had earlier about whether or not um, Egg's, one of Egg's sisters um, became pregnant with Dunk's son. I, I, I don't... I mean, this would make for a tragic story, uh, and and I, I gave it a slightly short shrift earlier, but uh, this would indeed make for a tragic story if if Dunk does um, uh, fall in love with uh, an a egg sister, say, um, and they're having a child, um, but he is in the Kingsguard and he decides he actually he can't break his vows. Um, and or maybe he only discovers about the child after he has joined the the king's guard um but she needs to be married off somewhere and so she could be married to someone in tarth and that is how the um the shield is there because then her child may well have memories of dunk's uh shield or she will have memories of dunk's shield so it's possible that's a, a way there but it's Occam's razor is he just visited. <laughs> that's that's the um, uh, that's the simplest answer, um, but it's entirely possible. Yeah, the 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 Dunks sister thing is. I, I get it. It's it's hard to prove either that it is true or it isn't. It's so my instinct is just just go with the easiest option. Um, okay, let's go have a quick uh, uh, go through the chat. Andrew K saying. For me, Egg's dragon obsession seems different than most other targs. It seems more of a selfless nature um, needed for his reforms or fixing the realm, etc. 
Um, yeah, possibly. We, we, I don't think we've got all of that information yet. He definitely wanted to reform things to be better for the small folk. We know that when he came to into power. Um, Wheezy Squeezebox saying, why would Dunk give up the shield which was painted for him by Tansel too tall? Um, I mean, whether he gave it up or whether he lost it or... I don't know. It certainly it was just down there in. Uh, it wasn't a, a treasured family memory. Um, by the time it got to Brienne, she just remembers it being there. So um, yeah, I mean that you could come up with a, a million and one possible ideas of, of why he could have uh, he could have lost it. Somebody might have um, defeated him in battle and demanded it as a as a. Uh, in, some fight and demanded it as as sort of the rewards of victory. I may maybe it got uh, maybe he lost it at sea and then it washed up on Tarth. There are lots of ways it could have ended up there, um, but uh, yeah, George R. Martin simply has not told us yet. Um, <laughs> true yellow dot saying in deep goal. Um, yeah, that's the name of my next channel. Um, uh, let's go to Reflective Rambling saying, branch out, dear God's man, how many hours a day are there? Not not, not enough. Not enough. Uh, Phoenix Milburn saying, do you have an opinion on who will win the throne in the end of all of this? Uh, the Iron Throne? I think the Iron Throne will be destroyed. I think that it is an analog for the One Ring and everybody's fighting for it and trying to get it but the only solution is for it to be destroyed um, symbolically. Um, Andrew Kay saying, if it's not Dunk, it has to be Jace and Sarah Snow, but Dunk works so much better, especially with a more direct connection to Bran. That's talking about who's the very tall knight. The, the tall thing is the, the hint that it's Dunk, I think. Um, um, and... I think with that, um, I will start drawing to uh, this one to a close. Um, so apologies again for the, the green background. I don't know. The technology deserted me again, but I don't think it turned out too bad. I think it's, it's quite a relaxing green. Um, next week, the, I've got a Lord of the Rings live stream set up. We have been promised a teaser trailer for the Rings of Power for next Thursday. Now, if that's if there's a lot in there, uh, what I may do is turn that into a breakdown of that trailer, uh, so uh, we can sort of talk through that, um, and then sort of push the what I was I was going to look at the Fellowship of the Rings um, there, um, and maybe I can push that one back. I don't know yet. What I'm saying is there will be a live stream next week and it's going to be a Lord of the Rings themed one, but I don't know yet exactly what it's going to be about. Um, in terms of uh, a couple of weeks time, we'll come back, to, I think, to be doing some uh, Song of Ice and Fire content or probably I'm going to start moving this towards House of the Dragon. If you've got ideas about what you would like to have live streams about in the build up to House of the Dragon, because we're less than two months away now. Um, and uh, are there bits about the history, the build-up to it, some of the characters? Um, let me know down in the comments uh, what it is that you think would be really useful for us to be discussing um, in um, uh, in live streams and the build-up to that. Um, Joel Elson, thank you uh, for the super sticker saying uh, next time. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Um, if you are watching this back a little bit later, appearing somewhere around here will be a link to other live streams I've done appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to my Patreon page. Uh, thanks, everyone. Some fantastic questions. Particular thank you to the moderators. You are wonderful. And I will see you again next time. Take care.